tonight. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. As Donald Trump begins his presidency, we had won the election that no one thought we would win. The inside story of how he got there. Once I understood that he was willing to double down and be a fighter for what he believes in, I'm all in. They'd be carried out on a stretcher. Folks. It felt like a box of matches even before he took the stage. And they were just waiting for Donald Trump to come and light it. From his closest advisors. I had said to Mr. Trump one day, are you ready to win? And his rivals. He just got smacked by a two by four and it came out of nowhere. The provocative campaign. Nobody knows the system better than me. To the presidency. Which is why I alone can fix it. Tonight on Frontline, so help me God. Trump's road to the White House. Tonight's program contains graphic language. Viewer discretion is advised. Today is finally the day the presidential nominees have made it is their decision final day meeting. in America, and we are taking a look at the presidential race. And After a long, season. contentious presidential race. On election day, Donald Trump and his senior campaign team were huddled at Trump Tower. They went into election night believing that they were going to lose. At 5 o'clock, they received the first exit polls. When we got those early returns, the exit polls that I, I actually got at about 5.01, we all had a little bit of a gut punch. If Trump wants to win, he's got to hold on to Florida. In state after state, he was so far behind that I knew that he was going to lose because the exit polls don't get it wrong. We were getting crushed in, like, Michigan, Pennsylvania. I mean, just, and so from, like, 6 o'clock on, you know, we're all like, oh, my God. And look at all these wins we're projecting for Hillary Clinton right now. Take a look at the electoral map. It seemed to confirm what the media and political establishment had been saying for months. Donald Trump never had a chance. Every senior Republican that I talked to, with only one exception, thought that Trump was going to lose. But as the votes were counted in Florida, a surprise. And CNN projects Donald Trump will carry the state of Florida. With its 29 electoral votes, Donald Trump... Florida was just the beginning. There's a, there's a big old call to make right now. Donald Trump has won the state of Wisconsin, and there goes her blue wall. Late on election night, one of his senior campaign officials emailed me and just said, can you type President Trump? Fox News has called Pennsylvania for Donald Trump. Our communications director, Jason Miller, held up and said, AP just called. And I said, just called what? Which state? And he said, the whole race. This means that Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States. The most unreal, surreal <laughs> election we have ever seen. Chris Christie's son said, Kellyanne, your phone is ringing. I looked down. And it said, Uma Abedin. And she said, Secretary Clinton would like to speak with Mr. Trump. And I said, right now? And she said, if he's available. And I said, he's available. And I said, sir, Secretary Clinton. She had been first lady, a senator, and secretary of state. She conceded to an entrepreneur, reality TV star, and novice politician. The call lasted about a minute. In an electoral college victory that virtually no one saw coming a year ago, a few months ago, a week even ago. a month ago, <laughs> even yesterday. It was an oh my God moment. It was euphoria that we, we had won the election that no one thought we could win. Not long after, to the music from Harrison Ford's movie Air Force One, the president-elect arrived at his victory celebration. Even for him, it was an overwhelming feeling to see yourself be elected president of the United States. You're never going to see anybody like this again. He is somebody that defied every political rule that existed in a way that nobody has ever done before. It's my honor. It was an amazing evening. It's been an amazing two-year period. 
and I love this country. It was an unprecedented outcome. Over 17 months, Donald Trump had broken nearly every rule of American politics. Then came the question whether the way he had campaigned would be the way he would govern. Trump is going to be Trump. This idea that you can make him into something else, that's not what the people voted for. They voted for Trump as he is. That's the way they want him to be. And nobody's going to remake him. He will either succeed or fail being Donald Trump. The sheer unpredictability of a President Donald Trump. How unpredictable the new terrain here in Washington is. Is this our yeah. new normal? Is there reason for concern? The creation of a new reality. Donald That's Trump crazy. has broken the rules of what it means to be president. What Trump are we going to see, do you think? We're going to constantly have rules that are broken in my way or the highway. Uh, president Trump is very much a wild card. If we call it a political earthquake, an unraveling of the system, or even a revolution. The seeds of Donald Trump's presidency are embedded in his path to power. He redefined what it meant to be a serious presidential candidate, starting with his announcement. I remember watching the announcement and, and laughing at the entertainment value the way a lot of people did. In Washington, you could almost just hear people around town laughing uh, at, the, at, the, at the idea that this person was going to be a credible threat. He seemed like a cartoon character. He did the exact opposite of what every candidate has done before him. It was like extending the middle finger to the political establishment. And in doing that, in that very first moment, people took a look at him and said, you know what? He really is different. That is some group of people, thousands. I wrote uh, what was supposed to be his announcement speech, and that speech was supposed to clock in at about seven minutes and 43 seconds. Because we got to make the country rich. It sounds crass. Somebody said, oh, that's crass. It's not crass. We got 18 trillion in debt. Probably three or four minutes into his remarks, I could clearly tell that these were not the prepared remarks, which I had drafted, and then he had gone on to make an announcement speech, which lasted somewhere around 45 or 48 minutes. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. When he made his comments about Mexicans, everybody was convinced, that's it. He just blew himself up. Everybody was like, oh, this is, this is gonna be the death of him. Behind the scenes, Trump's campaign was as unconventional as his announcement. Donald Trump's campaign was lean and small, and in a sense, run out of Donald Trump's, you know, instincts. I mean, he threw all of the normal things out the window. Corey Lewandowski, an obscure political operative, was the campaign's manager. In my very first meeting with Mr. Trump, when he offered me the position to be his campaign manager in January of 2015, he asked me what I thought his odds were of winning the Republican nomination. I said, 5%. And he said, 10. I said, let's settle at 7.5. They worked 50 floors below Trump's New York penthouse. It had once housed the set where The Apprentice was shot. All of The Apprentice camera equipment and furniture had been ripped out of it. You looked up in the ceiling and it was open piping. It was bare bones and a lot of Trump pictures all over the walls. As key advisors, Trump chose his children. Running things behind the scenes, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. It's this family business with Ivanka and his, her brothers, Eric and Don Jr., and Ivanka's husband, Jared, we had this kind of council uh, of advisors around Trump that he would turn to. The campaign had a fundamental rule. Let Trump be Trump. I used to liken my role to being a jockey on a great racehorse, and I'd say American Pharaoh. And my job was to maybe Drive that horse into the corners a little bit and put some blinders on, but you gotta let it run. Donald Trump is back on the road campaigning. He caused controversy from the very start. Secure the evangelical vote with three campaign events in Iowa today. In Iowa, as he was interviewed by Republican pollster Frank Luntz. And he and I get into an exchange over John McCain because he's taking shots at McCain. And I thought they were gratuitous. He's not a war hero. He's a war hero. He's a war hero. Five and a half years He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Do you He's agree with that? He's a war hero because he was captured. I couldn't believe he said that. I was completely stunned. Everyone in that room, 
thought, this is it. It's over. Folks, I want to make America great again. We want to get down to brass tacks. We don't want to listen to his stuff with being politically correct and everything has to We have a lot of work to do. You know, I asked Mr. Trump after he came off the stage to have a private conversation with him, and I said, I think we need to fix this. And when I said fix it, I meant an apology. And Donald Trump understood things that I didn't understand about the American people, said, no, no, you don't understand. Trump refused to apologize. And once I understood that he was willing to double down on his comments and be a fighter for what he believes in, I'm all in. And I'm there with you to support you. Don Voyage, Trump is toast after insults. Yeah, everything erupted after this. Virtually every exploded. Republican criticized Trump for This clip comments. is played on every newscast for the next 48 hours. So far, Trump's political campaign operates with a no guts, no glory approach. And he survived it. He survived walls and Mexicans and everything. That which doesn't kill us and makes us stronger. And if he ever needed any evidence, just look at Donald Trump. The biggest event to date in campaign 2016 Top 10 is now candidates here. taking the stage. Donald Trump gearing up for the crucial Two and a half weeks later in Cleveland, debate. the first Republican debate. Businessman Donald Trump. He was facing off against a group of candidates Republican leaders touted as the best in a generation. It is 9 p.m. on the East Coast, and the moment of truth has arrived. Among the other candidates, there was this sort of smug confidence that we know what we're doing. This guy is from show business, a little bit Hollywood, a lot of razzle-dazzle. Early in the debate, he faced a crucial test. Whether his tabloid past and outrageous statements would sink his campaign. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account Only Rosie several... O'Donnell. No, it wasn't. Trump doesn't deny it. He simply says, I only said that about Rosie O'Donnell. And in a way, that is pure Trump. What I say is what I say. And honestly, Megan, if you don't like it, I'm sorry. I've been very nice to you, although I could probably maybe not be based on the way you have treated me, but I wouldn't do that. He's doing something that is both repellent and completely authentic all at once. And he's acknowledging that he said these horrid things. He's not shirking it. I think there were voters out there that said, you go, man. You said exactly what you think, and you're not backing down. And Trump wasn't done. After the debate, the candidates appeared in what is known as Spin Alley. Trump kept the controversy going. Donald Trump shows up as if he needed this hit of adrenaline before he went home to New York. It's okay? Yep. Yes, sir. Don't hurt yourselves. <laughs> it was like mosquitoes to, to a lantern on a summer night. I mean, the entire national press corps descended. People were being trampled and camera equipment was flying all over the place. And I'd never seen a scene like this. I mean, I've seen many media stampedes, but nothing like that. Megan, What's your history with Megan? Megan? I think Megan behaved very badly personally. It's the question about women. You didn't like that? No, I thought it was an unfair question. They didn't ask those questions. Trump can't help himself because he considers anybody questioning his bona fides as someone who he needs to decapitate, essentially. It was just the beginning. At 3.40 in the morning, he lit up Twitter. Wow, Megyn Kelly really bombed tonight. People are going wild on Twitter. Funny to watch. This is on the phone with CNN, he pushed harder. What is it with you and Megyn Kelly? She starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions. And, you know, you could see there was blood coming out of her eyes. Uh, blood coming out of her wherever. Donald but... Trump attacks her and suggests she only asked a tough question because she was menstruating. I mean, um, and his numbers went up. She's a lightweight. I couldn't care less about her. In fact, you're competing against her. And I'm At every stage in the campaign, uh, Donald Trump was perfectly happy to have the elites be aghast at him. The kind of non-politically correct, uh, decisive, tough, uh, battling kind of uh, personality that he was putting forward in that debate and in the confrontations with Megyn Kelly and others that he sought out. While the media controversy swirled, Trump was out in the country building his base. His personal plane rolled up to hangars filled with curious onlookers eager to see the reality TV star in person. 
There were a lot of people who were there who were pure curiosity seekers. They were there to see a celebrity. They were there to see the guy they know from The Apprentice. Trump is a producer at heart, and when he did these rallies, he made sure that the staging was perfect. So we see the, the same elements that Trump applied in his uh, hit TV show, The Apprentice. We saw that in the early rallies. And right at the moment of the first chord, Trump hits the stage. And I felt this wave go through me. And that was the moment that I realized, holy this is real. It was like Pavlov's dog. He hits the stage. They erupt. I'd never seen this before. Trump just had them in the palm of his hand. He, I mean, they were responding to him. He was responding to them. Those crowds at those rallies, they were tremendously energizing to him. I mean, it was, a, it was a symbiotic relationship. They fed off of each other. The crowd fed off of him, he fed off of the crowd. For Donald, confidence is a huge part of the game. This was the whole point of all those rallies. It wasn't just to fire up people to vote for him. It was to fire up Donald Trump. He feeds off of audiences in a way that I think very few politicians do and needed to be energized by the affirmation, and it worked. And you know, we're in, look at all those live television feeds. It's always tough. Every time I speak, they put me on live television, so I have to make different speeches. These guys go around, they make the same speech hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Nobody cares, it's true. He was looking out at the camera bank, and he could see the red light on the camera, and that meant that he was live on CNN. You got CNN live, you got them all. Or Fox, or one of the other networks, and he said that what he tried to do in those rallies was say whatever it took to keep the red light on. Now, if you like the media, give him a big hand, and if you don't, give him a big boo. Rather than rely primarily on polls, I had a feeling Trump watched to see how the crowd reacted. Early on, they were kind of these rally speeches were a bit rambling and all over the place. As he went on, he started uh, to really hone his message, and he started to remember what lines worked. We're going to have such a strong military that nobody, nobody is going to mess with us. What the crowds us. wanted? Nobody. Donald Trump. We are led by very stupid people. Unfiltered. We are going to start winning big league. Angry. We can't beat ISIS. Give me a break. And it was every location. It was the same messages. We're tired of Washington lying to us. Gonna drive the cars over the illegals. Build a wall. Build a wall. American people are angry. And they have a right to be. And what they see in Donald Trump is someone who's willing to fight for them for a change. He called them the forgotten and spoke directly to their fears and anger at Washington, at trade deals, at immigration. People in this country are afraid of illegal immigrants. People in this country have become afraid of random violence. They're afraid of jobs being shipped overseas. There's so much that scares Americans. And Donald Trump was the only politician who talked to those concerns and those fears. To his critics, it's fear-mongering. To his supporters, it's truth-telling. Donald Trump is the projected winner of the New Hampshire. He gains his front-runner status in a crowded field. He's pulling in ahead in virtually every Super Tuesday state. In one state after another. We love Nevada. We love Nevada. Thank you. Trump proved that he could use his base of working-class voters to win. It's mostly white. They don't like political correctness. They feel like they can't speak their mind at home or at work. And so they want something else. Trump strolls in. He says exactly what they want to hear. This makes back-to-back -back victories for Donald Trump, dominating his third consecutive Donald Trump is a professional political wrecking ball. Finally, his opponents had to take him seriously. At that point, the establishment suddenly wakes up and says, we've got to do something. 
We've got to go after him. We can't ignore him anymore. He's a race-baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot. And you know how you make America great again? Tell Donald Trump to go to hell. The establishment feared him for a lot of reasons. One, he was not of them. Two, he didn't play by their rules. And three, they genuinely thought he was a threat, certainly to the Republican Party, to conservatism, and if he got that far, to the nation. Guys, we have a con artist as the front runner in the Republican Party. A guy who has made a career out of telling people lies. It was a shock to the Republican establishment. They did everything they could, for the most part, to prevent him. Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud. His promises are as worthless as a degree from Trump University. He's playing the members of the American public for suckers. Every time the establishment attacked Trump, it played into the narrative that they wanted to uh, put out there, which was that he was so anti-establishment, they were going to do anything that they, that they could to take him down. This man is a pathological liar. He lies practically every word that comes out of his mouth. Tonight, live from the Peace Center in Greenville, South Carolina. The On the debate stage, debate. Trump hit back. The and I'll, single and I'll biggest you. liar. You probably are worse than Jeb Bush. You are the single biggest liar. One by one, each rival comes at him. He throws him away. He said he would take his pants off and moon everybody. Tosses a barb in their direction, diminishes them personally. And then he tells me, oh, my language was a little bit rough. Okay. My Destroys their record. This little guy has lied so much. Donald Trump had the ability to just grab the microphone, just trample over people. Uh, th that was entertaining. It was different. He hit my hands. Nobody has ever hit my hands. I've never heard of this one. Look at those hands. Are they small hands? <laughs> and he referred to my hands. If they're small, something else must be small. I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee you. It was ruthless political performance by Donald Trump. He had nothing to lose, and he owed nothing to the Republican Party. So instead of standing there as a member of a party trying to get the nomination, he was there for Trump. That changed everything. Scott Walker is quitting the presidential one by race. One by one, Chris Christie have suspended their campaign. Trump's competitors began to fall. Surgeon ben Carson dropping out of the 2016 GOP. But on the campaign trail, at some rallies, things were increasingly ugly. only increased as it got farther along. It became completely acceptable. It became okay to come to a Trump rally and wear a shirt that says Hillary Clinton is a CT. And there were some in the crowds with a darker agenda. The campaign is continually dogged by a small and vocal number of white supremacists, Klansmen, neo-Nazis. Some would come in wearing Confederate flags on their T-shirts. This isn't a very large group of people, but they're very vocal. And they attach themselves to Trump. Trump, whenever there was a moment to draw a line between himself and these extreme parts of the voting bloc, he refused. And I think without question, the only way you can interpret that is that he was going to use these groups to try to build this coalition. It wasn't long before anti-Trump protesters began to show up inside the rallies. There's a guy totally disruptive, throwing punches. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. That's true. And you start seeing these really ugly moments, the rallies, um, with uh, protesters, some, some of whom are, are non-white protesters, getting treated very violently by, by his supporters. Trump himself seemed to incite his supporters to, to go after protesters. Knock the crap out of him, would you? Just knock the hell. I promise you, I will pay for the legal fees. Trump didn't just turn on the protesters. He also directed the anger at the media. Absolute dishonest, absolute scum. Remember that. Scum. Scum. NBC's Katie Turr became a frequent target after one of her reports. She's back there. Little Katie. She's back there. He calls me out the rally. Look back there. Little Katie, she's back there. And I was, I was like, what? What a lie it was. No, 
What a lie. Katie Turr. What a lie it was from NBC to have written that. It was a total lie. We are surrounded on all sides with people who are fired up and angry. Third-rate reporter. Remember that. Third-rate. Third-rate. And, and they are whipped up by Donald Trump. I, I described it as like, you know, an unchained beast roaring at you in a crowd. And the whole, the whole place turns at me, looks at me, and boos. By July, Donald Trump headed to the GOP convention after soundly defeating the establishment candidates. And let's face it, he was larger than the Republican Party. In fact, his nomination was the hostile takeover of the Republican Party. In this case, the Republican Party is just a vehicle to get his name on the ballot, but his reach was always greater than the Republican Party's reach. He had won the nomination of a divided Republican Party. Now he would see if he could apply the same strategy to winning the presidency of a divided country. Our convention occurs at a moment of crisis for our nation. The attacks on our police and the terrorism of our cities threaten our very way of life. And I think the essential message there was you have been neglected and abused by the powers that be, whether they are politicians or the media or academia or Hollywood. All of those folks are conspiring against you, the, the good, right-thinking middle Americans. I have joined the political arena so that the powerful can no longer beat up on people who cannot defend themselves. Nobody knows the system better than me. Which is why I alone can fix it. He just said, me, I'm the only person that can do this. You have to support me. Um, that's the language of a strong man. That's the language that you hear in, in autocratic societies. I had at least five reporters approach me and say, didn't you think Trump's speech was too dark? And I told them all, no, I think the country's in deep trouble. We're in very dire times. And to pussyfoot around that and claim things are great is a mistake, and we need a strong man. And so, my friends... Just one week later, at the Democratic Convention, Hillary Clinton accepted her party's nomination. ...that I accept your nomination for President of the United States. Clinton's strategy was to draw on Obama's legacy and bet big on diversity. This is a time of change for America, and it's a time to take stock and reaffirm the values that we hold as Americans. And that meant embracing the diversity. Please welcome Kaiser Kong. One moment turned out to be the centerpiece of their efforts, a speech by the father of a Muslim American soldier killed in combat. If, if it was up to Donald Trump, he never would have been in America. Donald Trump consistently smears the character of Muslims. He disrespects other minorities, women, judges, even his own party leadership. I don't think anybody or very few people who were planning the convention thought simply that moment alone would be as powerful as it was. Donald Trump, have you even read the United States Constitution? I will, I will gladly lend you my copy. As he watched Khan's speech, Trump saw an opportunity to go on the attack. I was viciously attacked by Mr. Khan at the Democratic Convention. And his advisors thought this was not a good idea. He shouldn't have done it, but Donald Trump just can't help himself. Mr. Khan, who does not know me, viciously attacked me from the stage of the DNC and is now all over TV doing the same. 
nice. The Khan episode illustrates Donald's major flaw, is he can't let something go, and he can't notice that he's losing a fight until he's really lost it. He went after Khan's wife, Gazala. If you look at his wife, she was standing there. She had nothing to say. She probably, maybe she wasn't allowed to have anything to say. You tell me, but plenty of people have written that. Amid mounting backlash over Trump's comments, his campaign went into damage Veterans control. groups were outraged. At least two new polls show Hillary Clinton with a widening lead over Trump. As Trump's poll numbers collapsed. Republicans in particular have been quick to respond. Republican leaders further distanced themselves. Senator John McCain offered a scathing And his advisors are horrified. I mean, this is like, this is political suicide. Side. And um, they say to Trump, you know, you, you know you just attacked a gold star family. And he said, well, what's that? Trump just sees it as a personal attack, and it's within his right to go on the counterattack. Trump's ongoing battle with the family of U.S. Army Captain Humi Virtually Khan, all the professionals expected Iran. Trump to change his tactics, to pivot. Everybody always wanted to mold Mr. Trump into their own image of what a candidate should look like, what a president should look like. And uh, if there's one thing that wasn't going to change about Mr. Trump was that he was going to stay true to himself, you know, whatever that means, and, and that, that uh, if he was going to win this campaign, he was going to do it on his own terms. With barely 80 days before the election, Trump shook up his campaign and brought in Steve Bannon, the chairman of the right-wing website Breitbart. Bannon is a bomb thrower. Bannon joins the campaign because Bannon has a superior knowledge of alternative media, combined with the fact that he's kind of a swashbuckler and a revolutionary, a guy who can think outside the box. It was a sign Trump was doubling down. Steve Bannon has made very clear all through recent career, his goal is to blow up the establishment. It's to take down the government as we know it. It's to destroy the Republican Party as it was constituted. I mean, he's a, he's a disruptor in, you know, in, in almost every way. As his new campaign manager, another unconventional pick, a pollster, Kellyanne Conway, who had bad news for Trump. On that day, I told him, I said, what's going on? Because you're running against the most joyless candidate in presidential political history, and this place is starting to seem like it. And he said, no. Uh, and I said, I've looked at the polls. He said, the polls. And I said, I've looked at the polls, and we're losing. But you don't need to lose. You should be winning. Trump is hoping to finally put that controversy behind They faced a formidable challenge. He's hurt himself some. The first presidential debate. As Trump and Clinton get ready to go head to head. What will likely be the most watched political showdown. As he had throughout his campaign, Trump was willing to gamble. He'd rely on his instincts, not preparation. There's actually a point of pride that he doesn't have to prepare. He values raw ability over study. So he wanted to prove that he was right about that. Trump mocked Clinton for spending so much of her time preparing for the debate. I just, you know, you've seen me. I've been all over the place. Uh, you decided to stay home, and that's OK. Arguably, he was the worst prepared candidate in the history of American politics when he stepped up against Hillary Clinton for that first debate, and it showed. That I think Donald just criticized me for preparing for this debate. And yes, I did. And you know what else I prepared for? I prepared to be president, and I think that's a good thing. She knew how to get under his skin. She had been practicing. She had been studying him. Donald thinks that climate change is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. I think it's real. I, I did I not. Science I do not, is real. I do not say that. And I think it's I do important not say that. The team knew what this, were his, knew what his buttons were. And she just started unleashing them one after the other. You call yourself the king of debt? You talk about leverage. You even at one time suggested that you would try to negotiate down the Wrong. national debt of the Wrong. United States. And he, he, lo he lost control of the debate. Let me say it, There's nothing crazy is about not letting our companies case. bring their money it, back into okay, their this country. Is, this is uh, Secretary Clinton's two minutes, yes. please. I, I have a feeling that by the end of this evening, I'm going to be blamed for everything that's ever happened. Why not? Why not? Yeah, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Hillary Clinton was, was very artful in getting under Mr. Trump's skin, uh, in bringing up the, the issues that, that were like putting, you know, gasoline on a fire. One of the worst things he said was about a woman in a beauty contest, and 
he called this woman Miss Piggy. Then he called her Miss Housekeeping because she was Latina. Donald, she has a name. Where did you find her? Her name Where is Alicia Machado. Where did you find Machado, her? Did you find and her? she has become a U.S. citizen, and you can bet oh, really? she's going to vote okay. this November. Okay, good. Right. Well, that is Trump would insist he had won. Our debate for this evening, a spirit He was one crushed in the first debate. I don't care whatever pronouncements he wants to make, he was crushed by every possible and our focus group thought he was awful. Palm Beach. I moved on her, and I failed. I'll admit it. Whoa. it I, I did try and f her. She was married. <laughs> huge news there. No, no, Nancy. It would get even worse for Trump. I moved on her like a bitch, <laughs> but I couldn't get there, and she was married. Just two second, days before the second debate, an unaired video from the TV show Access Hollywood. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. There was one account after another about Donald Trump attacking women, groping women, uh, saying nasty things about women. But the moment that counts is the moment this is on video. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the <laughs> I can do anything. Here's a guy who's making crude, disgusting jokes, and the father in you, the brother in you, comes out, and the husband in you, and, and you can't defend it. The Trump camp has swiftly launched into disaster A mode. big, big development in this campaign as it comes Right after that tape came out, suddenly everybody on the Trump team went radio silent. Everyone. This was the October surprise. Had the ability to take down a campaign, and the internal discussion amongst the campaign some were, you need to apologize immediately, and some were, you need to uh, double down. Donald Trump's campaign, its worst crisis ever. We keep being told he's going to come on TV, he's going to say something, he's going to apologize, and it gets delayed and delayed, and finally he comes out there, and it's, it's an apology of sorts. I've never said I'm a perfect person, nor pretended to be someone that I'm not. I've said and done things I regret, and the words released today on this more than a decade old video are one of them. And so he went on uh, Facebook later that night and gave what was by Trump standards a contrite apology. But then he went on the attack. Bill Clinton has actually abused women and Hillary has bullied, attacked, shamed and intimidated his victims. I think Trump being Trump, his only instinct in those moments when his back is against the wall is to just go on the counterattack. We will discuss this more in the coming days. See you at the debate. I think with the exception of maybe one or two people, everyone thought that that was the end. How do you survive this? How do you survive this? As a Republican, how do you survive advocating or saying you're allowed to grab women in their private parts because you're a star? That is just not something that anybody can survive. I think the question now is, how do Republicans down the ballot break away from him? The next day, he appeared outside Trump Tower. To many, it seemed like his candidacy was over. I call Trump the day after Access Hollywood, and I ask him point blank, are you gonna quit the race? That's what was on everyone's mind. And he says, Costa, I've lived life. I've seen so much in my life, business, personal. This is nothing. I've survived everything else. I'm gonna survive this. And I kept asking him, are you gonna quit the race? There's no chance I quit, he said. Not one chance. I am in this to the end. Donald Trump, undaunted, then headed to the second presidential debate. He showed up and he was impervious to the naysayers and critics who were all trying to push him out of the race. Trump had a surprise of his own just before the debate was to begin. Next thing I know, and no one in the press knew this was happening, there was a press conference with all Bill Clinton's accusers right before the debate. These four very courageous women have asked to be here, and it was Trump had invited four women to the debate. Women who had accused Bill and Hillary Clinton of wrongdoing, charges the Clintons had denied. There was widespread shock. Nobody had it beforehand. The genius part of Donald Trump was he didn't announce these women were coming. He just had them at a table and said, the media is welcome to come in right before the debate. And the media was stunned because the media couldn't fathom doing something like this. Standing in the back of the room, the man who had orchestrated the event, Steve Bannon. Mr. Trump may have said some bad words, 
But Bill Clinton raped me, and Hillary Clinton threatened me. I don't think there's any comparison. It was to show America that he believed certain things about the Clintons that many Americans also believe, and he, that he was going to stand up for them against the Clintons uh, in a way that was so tough and really so ruthless that it gave some satisfaction to people who hate the Clintons. OK, thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Mr. Trump, did you touch women without their consent? Mr. Trump, did you touch women without consent, Mr. Trump? Why don't you ask Bill Clinton that? Why don't you go ask Bill Clinton that? Go ahead and ask Hillary as well. By bringing the accusers to the debate, he put that issue front and center and forced voters out there to remember, in a sense, what it is that they didn't like about Hillary Clinton. This time on the debate stage, Trump stayed on the offensive. We have a divided nation because people like her, and believe me, she has tremendous hate in her heart. She's got tremendous hatred. And this country cannot take another four years of Barack Obama, and that's what you're getting with her. I don't think there was any moment in the campaign in which there was a more divergent interpretation among political professionals and members of Trump's vast and growing army of supporters. But when you talk about apology, I think the one that you should really be apologizing for and the thing that you should be apologizing for are the 33,000 emails that you deleted and that you acid washed. Hillary Clinton, who's uh, clearly much more measured and programmed than Trump. On the other hand, uh, he's so much more of a, a live wire that, by contrast, she seems overly programmed. Allow her to respond, please. Personal emails, not oh, official. 33,000? Not, yeah. well, we turned over 35,000, so oh, yeah. it was... What about the other 15,000? Uh, please allow her to respond. She didn't talk while you talked. Yes, that's true. I didn't. And I didn't in the say. first debate, and uh, I'm going to try not He's to. He's mocked for this during and after the debate, kind of stalking around just, that debate, kind of stalking her. He's, you know, ridiculed for suggesting that he's going to put her in jail. But if I win, I am going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation, because there has never been so many lies, so much deception. There has never been anything like it. When he looked her straight in the eye and said that there should be a commission to study the crimes you've done. And to my surprise, my focus group said, absolutely. Even those who supported Hillary Clinton want to see these candidates held accountable. We have to move on. You Secretary Clinton, you can respond minute. and then we got to move on. We wanted to the audience. So for what the media saw as third world dictatorial politics, our voters saw as one candidate holding the other candidate accountable. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Because you'd be in jail. We want to remind the audience to please not uh, talk out loud. Please do not applaud. You're just wasting when time. When I speak, I go out and speak. The people of this country are furious. He was speaking the language of the American people, that he was holding Hillary Clinton accountable. You wouldn't know that if you lived in New York or Los Angeles, but you would know that if you're doing focus groups in Columbus, Ohio, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Back out on the campaign trail, Trump's anti-establishment message continued to resonate. And we are going to drain the swamp. Going to drain the swamp. We're going to drain the swamp. That was how Donald Trump started out the campaign. We're going to drain that swamp. By saying things that were anathema to the establishment, but that had resonance in the base of support that he was able to cobble together. Yes, maybe he has offended me, and maybe he's offensive, but I'm still out of work. I, I'm still mad that people are pouring over the borders, and I'm still mad that, that ISIS is still attacking people all over the globe. And you know what? I'm just going to stick with him. With time running out, Trump's chances of winning still seemed slim. But the race would be shaken up by an unlikely source, WikiLeaks. 
breaking news here. WikiLeaks is about to release, quote, significant material tied to Hillary The campaign is doing damage control tonight after WikiLeaks released more. Tens of thousands of private emails from Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta were released. There are some embarrassing details. This was a daily phenomenon. Both at home and abroad in all of this. It was a constant, uh, uh, you know, uh, pain to our campaign. A flood of emails suggest that in private, her advisors like to tee off on everyone, from Catholics to Latinos and Southerners. Day after day, the stories continued. That she couldn't convey a clear message to voters. It was incredibly damaging because every day there were bad stories coming out and they could be perfectly timed. Senator Robbie Mook lashed out, writing, quote, wow, what a terrorist. It was anxiety provoking. You just don't know what's going to come out any day and that you're going to have to deal with that. More than 2,000 emails. They claim the first emails began to trickle out less than an hour after the Access Hollywood video. The Access Hollywood tape was a, a big surge, but then, you know, after it had run 400 times on television, it fell off. The Podesta emails kept getting dribbled out news cycle after news cycle after news cycle, and it lives forever. There were media reports that intelligence agencies believed the leaks were orchestrated by Russia, but that didn't seem to bother Trump. WikiLeaks is amazing. The stuff that's coming out, it shows she's a real liar. This WikiLeaks stuff is unbelievable. It tells you the inner heart. You gotta read it. WikiLeaks, I love WikiLeaks. After the election, intelligence agencies would go further concluding that the leaks were part of a larger campaign ordered by Russian President Vladimir Putin to help elect Donald Trump. It was cyber mixed with information warfare. And the press, the New York Times included, became the handmaiden to the process because these emails couldn't be ignored as news. They were newsy. They were out there. It's not like you could ignore it and not write about it. But in writing about it, you're doing the work that Vladimir Putin had in mind. Then in the final days, as Hillary Clinton struggled to hold on to her lead, another crisis. An LA Times reporter came up to our uh, traveling press secretary, Nick Merrill, and, and said, hey, have you heard anything about some reopening of the investigation by the FBI? I kept thinking, this can't be, this has to be a mistake, it's gotta be referring to something else. The FBI director, James Comey, was resuming an investigation of Clinton's personal email server. And I just remember this pit in my stomach and really worrying that this could change the game completely um, in, in, a, you know, in a potentially lethal way. Mook and Palmieri briefed Clinton. When I went to tell her, I said, I got some news. And she said, OK, what's your news? And I said, it's bad news. <laughs> so um, she said, OK, what's the bad news? And so I told her. And she said, I knew we weren't going three weeks without something else hitting us. That pit in my stomach, you know, I'll never forget that, that feeling that um, you just got smacked by a two by four and it came out of nowhere. Donald Trump immediately seized on the news. I need to open with a very critical breaking news announcement. The FBI has just sent a letter to Congress informing them that they have discovered new emails <laughs> pertaining to the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's investigation. And they are reopening the case into her criminal and illegal conduct that threatens the security of the United States of America. To win, you need a few breaks. 
the FBI announcement was such a break. Certainly not controlled by the Trump campaign, but it really did throw all the cards up in the air at a pivotal time. We are going to drain the swamp. For the next week and a half, we are going to renegotiate our terror. Trump trade. traveled the country building on that and momentum. We will keep radical Islamic terrorists staying on message. The hell out off of Twitter. Out. We will build a great wall. Inside his campaign, they hoped it would be enough. And we will make America great again. It was the first time that Mr. Trump was relatively scandal-free at that point. A lot of things had gone away. Uh, Secretary Clinton was in the spotlight by herself. And we saw a spike in numbers that were just uncommon for anything that we've seen before. That was really the catalyst for the roll, the, the snowball effect that continued to happen until Election Day. In the final days of the campaign, he solidified the Republican base. And in rally after rally, he tried to win over voters in the heart of the Blue Wall, states a Republican hadn't won in a generation. In all these steel towns that have carcasses of factories, buildings where they used to have molten metal, no more. But know what was there? Trump signs. It is Decision Day in America, and we are taking a look at the presidential race. After a race. long, contentious presidential race, we are near the end. Donald Trump will carry the state of Florida with its 29... Donald election. Trump has won the state of Wisconsin, and there goes her blue wall. This means that Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States. As a candidate, he had broken all the rules. Now in the White House, he promises to do the same. You guys need to get used to it, that there is no pivot, that there is no normal. And the fact that there is no normal is the new normal. The only thing that is predictable is the unpredictability of Washington, D.C. from this point forward. So get used to it. Buckle your seatbelts, sit back, because it is going to be a wild ride. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. On the front line of Iraq's fight against ISIS. The distance between war and civilian life is almost non-existent. Correspondent Keith Abdullah is inside the besieged city of Mosul. This is the entrance of the building. Witnessing firsthand the casualties and the army's determination to take the city back. Battle for Iraq. Go to pbs.org slash frontline, where you can read extended interviews with Kellyanne Conway. Which we don't need to lose, you should be winning. John Podesta. Pained our campaign. And others. Incredibly damaging. I'm all in. Explore an interactive feature on the film with primary sources, video, and additional context in collaboration with Duke University. Connect to the Frontline community on Facebook and Twitter. Then sign up for our newsletter at pbs.org slash frontline. Thank you.